the so-called snake goddesses that we've seen them before of the temple repositories, exceptional faience statuettes with preserved colour decoration from the excavations of the Minoan Palace of Knossos, archaeology got a first good look at the form of dress which has attracted much scholarly attention since. The main components as described by Evans are firstly a skirt consisting of flounces fastened apparently on the foundation and secondly, a bodice cut away so as to expose both breasts. Within ten years of Evans's publication, this form of minor female dress was also documented on the Mycenaean mainland, that is, in the near life size wall paintings depicting processions of women uncovered at the palatial centres of Thebes and Tiryns. From the late 1960s onwards, copious wall painting finds from the site of Akrotirion Theatre would also document the combination of flounced skirt and open fronted garment in the Bronze Age Cyclades, while also permitting numerous new observations, amongst which I would like to single out but two. Firstly, the contrast between the apparently fringed or pleated flounces on Crete and the mainland on the one hand, and the flounces on Theron skirts on the other, which are either relatively plain or show presumably woven patterns, provides a striking instance of regional variations of the costume. And secondly, a series of scholars have come to question, largely in reference to the Akrotiri paintings, the idea of the bodice as a topless top, preferring instead to think of a fully or partially open-fronted long dress that was worn under and whose hem sometimes could be seen below a flounced skirt or short flounced kilt. This long dress has been linked with some plausibility to a garment of Weano in Linear B text and even to an apparently archaic reference in Homer um, to the goddess Thera fastening her Heanos Katastephos below the breast. If the identification of a Heanos in the Bronze Age wall paintings is indeed correct, then the very fact that such Heanoi are documented in palatial records would of course provide a clear answer to the question whether anybody is still wearing that. Um, or they wouldn't produce it in a document if they weren't wearing it. The question whether the traditional Manoan costume survived on the mainland in the 13th century as an actual form of dress, or merely as an element of an established wall painting iconography, has lent to archaeologists' fascination with the costume for several decades, and that such a debate would arise in the first place stems, lar stems largely from the fact that while, as Elizabeth Barber puts it, for the Cretans, this women's dress was traditional. For the Mycenaeans, it was borrowed lock, stock and barrel, and it contrasted sharply with a much more conservative native dress. Now, as far as the Heanos is concerned, however, Barber is among the not inconsiderable number of scholars that continue to adhere to the reconstruction of bodies, either doubting the validity of the long dress hypothesis or considering it yet another regional variation confined to the Cyclades. The debate is well illustrated by efforts at real life reconstructions. For Abby Lelithan, a proponent of identifying a bodice as a short, tight fitted jacket, even in Akrotiri, the closeness of fit with a painted prototype is a central criterion in weighing the plausibility of different reconstructions. <coughs> by clear contrast, Bernice Jones, as the main advocate for the Heanos, expresses fundamental doubts in the apparent tightness of garments in wall paintings, attributing it to a possible artistic license intended to emphasize the body at the expense of its clothing. For her, technical details such as the band which covers seams, finish cut and draw edges and mask the tops of applied flounces are more revealing indicators, which lead her to a reconstruction of the Heanos that convinces in its economy with regard to the use and wasted cloth. It remains difficult, however, to compare Jones's reconstruction to one that sets out from completely different premises. While, accordingly, I could not hope to resolve this debate today, it does provide important background to the somewhat peculiar fight I want to present and discuss. In the western staircase of Tiryns, the fine spot in 1910 of the well-known and previously shown near life-size procession of women, new excavations were undertaken in 1999. Not in order to find more frescoes, I should say, but simply as part of measures aimed at the conservation of the Acropolis of Tiryns and its better presentation to the public. 
Nonetheless, a very substantial group of war paintings was found, which I had the good luck of studying and preparing for publication with Alcestis Papadini Trio and Josef Marana. These finds encompass over 1,500 fragments and coherent sections of fragments and include several medium scale scenes. The largest of these, at a preserved size of 50.5 by 45.5 cm, provides the clearest medium scale attestation appearance of a processional scene, that is, of the canonical theme par excellence of Mycenaean wall painting. It shows, most likely, beside a date palm in which a bird sits, the feet, flounce, skirts, and long strands of hair of two women in procession to the right and the upper body of one of them. It also shows a thoroughly peculiar detail, that is, the ornamental band framing the neckline is continued across the upper part of the abdomen below the breasts, leaving the lower portion of the abdomen free. This inframammary band does not appear to make sense for either a bodice or a hair but the juxtaposition with Jones's well reconstruct well constructed reconstruction of the letter is particularly instructive, since here every textile band has a technical as well as an ornamental function. The headband above the shoulder results from weaving on a walk-weighted loom, but also serves to take in the raw cut edges of the two front panels. Other cut edges, apart from the hem, are either taken up in seams on the sides or finished with a textile band on the sleeves and along the front opening. The latter actually combines natural selvage in the lower section with bands around the neckline, according to Jones. What function, however, could the band below the breasts have served? The textile band would seem comparatively ill-suited and the continuous band, shown here, even less suited for pulling the garment closed in front, a purpose better served by lacing with a cord. The letter is indeed sometimes and rarely depicted, for example on the snake goddess Fayence shown earlier. The inability to provide a technical explanation of the intramammary band lends particular urgency to the question whether this detail could document an actual, possibly innovative variant of the traditional Manon costume, perhaps a light mycenaean or even a local form, or whether it represents a mistake on the part of the painter. Mistakes are not entirely uncommon in Mycenaean murals, and this particular one could easily stem from an incomplete understanding of what was depicted, and thus offer an indication that the traditional Mycenaean co uh, Minoan costume may indeed no longer have been a common sight in 13th century everyday life on the mainland, i.e. that we see a petrified tradition <coughs> in wall painting. Perhaps the most striking illustration how familiarity with the subject and precision in its rendering uh, are correlated in Mycenaean depiction is offered by a completely different iconographic theme, which I explored with Melissa Fetters, that is the horse-drawn chariot. Here, a series of distinctive features which set ch the gene chariots apart from Eastern Mediterranean counterparts are clearly captured not only in wall paintings, but also in the linear B logograms of the administrative staff that kept track of actual chariots. These logograms repeatedly capture all pertinent characteristics, such as the complex traction system. Repetition, of course, is crucial. If the unusual band below the breasts were to be found in the depiction, a one-time slip of the painter could be ruled out, suggesting either a surprisingly stubborn misconception of the subject, or an actual Tarinthian version of the minor costume. <coughs> the corresponding evidence is not conclusive, unfortunately, but it is certainly very suggestive. In another of the recently discovered medium-scale scenes, a young girl appears to be walking in front of what we tentatively identify as a group of male palanquin bearers. Despite its size, this female figure is closely reminiscent of those in the new procession scene, sharing their posture, uh, the style and cursory execution of the hair, as well as probably the very detail we're interested in, that is, the continuation of the textile band around the front of the body. The lack of detail, however, that comes with a small size, does not permit complete certainty. No other Tyrinthian depiction of women of festive dress repeats the inframammary band, but, and this is the suggestive part, neither would any appear to be incompatible with it. This can be illustrated again by the gift-bearing ladies of the near life-size procession, whose near arms, <coughs> sorry, whose near arms seem to be consistently held in a position which would obscure a band immediately below the breasts. 
In addition, the textile bands framing their bare abdomens show the same peculiar backward slant seen in the new procession scene and also repeated in further depictions from Tyrion's. This appears uh, a somewhat peculiar feature in the bodice and would hardly fit the assumption of a hair moss, a long dress, at all. Indeed, it has been linked by Bernice Jones to a third type of garment, the so-called bolero, reconstructed on the basis of a fairly small iconographic corpus. In Crete, it has most notably been identified on the Aia Triada sarcophagus, where it is worn either over a dress or on its own, though not in combination with a flounced kilt. A distinct mainland variety of the bolero, characterized by nota bene attached textile bands crossed below the breasts and tied behind the back, has been reconstructed based on the very limited remains of such textile bands in two murals. One, the so-called Mykenaia, the other, a procession scene from Pilos. In both instances, it would have been combined with the bodies or hyamos. At first sight, such a mainland bolero may appear to solve the problem I started from. Nonetheless, I retain some scepticism. While a bolero would explain the presence of a band below the breasts, this should not be continuous with a neckline band. Moreover, a bolero should encompass a second crossing band, and at least in the near life size Tyrion's procession, there should have been room to show this detail. And while Jones suggests that, I quote, the lower end of the bolero is tucked into the skirt in the depiction of the large scale procession from Tyrion's, well, that lower end would seem to be considerably more substantial and or less triangular than other depictions suggest. In the Aia Triada sarcophagus, uh, for example, the lower end barely reaches the base of the spine, while in frontal depictions, as stated by James herself, the boleros appear simply as sleeves. Thus, and moreover, since it used with other garments worn underneath would differ from the other main instances, sorry, its use in terms without other garments worn underneath would differ from other main instances, a putative Tyrion's bolero might almost be termed, please see the inverted commas, as a bodice, or bodice bolero hybrid. Yeah, a bodice, so to speak. Um, unless we were to rethink the form of the proposed main and bolero in general, then the garment with a single frontal band and the backward slant of the band frame in the abdomen could provide an important addition to other idiosyncrasies in the depiction of the traditional my own female costume in Tyrion's, regardless of whether we choose to term that garment bodice or bolero in archaeological retrospective. Other such idiosyncrasies are an unusual preponderance of ankle length skirts rather than shorter flounced kilts. Um, and their comparatively complex flounced structures as well as variegated and probably even asymmetric skirts, skirt backings, and lastly, the peculiar recurrence in some paintings of the bodices or bolero's band ornament in either a girdle or a skirt banded at the waist with the same design. These would seem promising characteristic to define as an innovation or local style or variant of the traditional female costume, thus allowing us to answer the question I chose as a title, both in the affirmative and the negative, at least for Terence. Yes. They still actually wore that and did not only show it in paintings, and no, it had actually developed into something noticeably different. And yet, the fact remains that the single frontal band, the asymmetric skirt backings, and the complex ornamental sequences are difficult to satisfactorily explain in terms of function and or technical construction. Along with the painter's addition of flounces in outline, where no flounce should naturally occur, these characteristics could thus well represent distortions in the increasingly ornamental pictorial transmission of an otherwise obsolete form of dress. I'll have to admit, therefore, to still being somewhat undecided about the question I posed myself, and thus the question whether the inframammary band is a mainland or Tyrion's innovation, or whether it is uh, instead indicative of the painted petrification of a tradition. Nonetheless, I hope that the simple fact that we can actually go on agonise for 15 minutes about no more than a seemingly misplaced textile band uh, could be considered in itself uh, to offer a taste of the study of Aegean Bronze Age costumes. Therefore, my particular thanks, um, and not surprisingly after the images you've seen, along with the Tyrion's project team, go to Bernice Jones, who, concerning another strangely placed band, once told me in a very inspirational discussion, and I quote, that has bothered me for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you.